go back to the fourth century. Here we have in the catacombs of Marcellinus and Peter in Rome, the second half of the fourth century, um, a depiction of Jesus uh, flanked by Paul and Peter holding the gospel and underneath there are the martyrs that they represented. Um, and the description is here, you can find this. And I wanted to show you a close-up of his face. It's not very clear, but he's bearded. He has flowing hair, long hair. Uh, he's holding the gospel and he's blessing with his right hand. Okay, what I want to tell you is that this is the beginning of iconography, of depiction of Jesus in the same way until today. At least in the East, he's been depicted like this, in the Eastern Church, in the Orthodox Church. Here is another one from the same period, Pierre the Jesus with the Alpha and the Omega, from the Catacomb of Comodilla, one of the first bearded images of Jesus, late 4th century. Okay, here in, um, in Senna Polinari in class in Ravenna, 6th century, from the time of Justinian, we have this cross with the face of Christ at the center, bearded again, long hair, similar tradition. And then I'm going to show you some mosaic word, work that was done uh, around this time, at the same time, when churches began to proliferate. After Constantine, after Christians receiving freedom to worship, to build churches, to worship freely and to, and to build churches freely. And the emperor even uh, underwrites the cost of many churches. He builds probably 450 churches around the empire at this time, during the 4th century, during his lifetime. Then um, we have the beginning of the proliferation of Christian art. The Christians are free, they develop, they take what they have in the traditions of the Romans and the Greeks, and they develop it and make it into a Christian tradition. And we're going to talk about why they're doing this as well, but I think you're going to see this as I talk, and uh, watch this, okay? This is uh, a vine. And this is from a floor of a, of a national church that has been destroyed by an earthquake in Paphos of Cyprus. And uh, the vine, of course, represents a couple of things. What? He said, I am the vine, right? And also, what do we get from the vine? Wine, right? So, the Holy Eucharist. So this is on the floor of this church, a mosaic. On the same floor, we have the deer. And this is a motif, I would say, or a, uh, a depiction that is found in many churches. And I'll show you a couple of them. Um, where the deer are in front of a spring of water. And I'll show you the next one, which will explain something. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. So the use of the deer is given uh, a meaning uh, that's deeper and uh, more profound than just an animal. As the, as the psalm explains, that my, song, uh, that my soul searches for you and longs for you, just like the deer, especially when they sense their time of death or they're sensing that they need water, they run to find water so that they can live longer. So Christians like the deer, um, they long for Christ, they long for the water that he promised the Samaritan woman and the water and the deer together represent that. Here is a classic example from uh, the mausoleum of Gallic Placidia that we saw before in 450, where the two deer are coming to the source of water. A cross on the floor in the church again um, of, uh, in Paphos of St. Paul, the church of St. Paul, at the location where St. Paul preached in Paphos, uh, as we learned from the Book of Acts in the first journey that he took 
um, that took him to Cyprus, through Cyprus. And on the same floor of that church, we have this, which is basically a chalice. And underneath says, wisdom has mingled her wine in a bowl. So what would this represent? A chalice, wine, mixed wine, mingled wine, okay? Say it. What does it represent? The Eucharist, communion. Okay, let me switch gears a little bit and I'm, I'm going to uh, tell you what the media, you already saw some things, but I want to give you a little more about what kind of media are used for creation of Christian iconography, uh, Christian icons, and to this day, what kind of media? Let's see. The first one is encaustic paintings. And uh, these are made with hot pigmented wax on wooden panel. If you search on the internet, you'll find this, this method. And it tells you how to do it. Don't try it, it's difficult. Don't burn yourself with the wax. But this is an ancient practice. I'll show you some of those beautiful ones that come to us from 2,000 years ago. Fresco is a technique of mural painting executed upon freshly laid or wet lime plaster. Water is used as the vehicle for the pigment to merge with the plaster. And with the setting of the plaster, the painting becomes an integral part of the wall. Okay? These particular murals can last forever because the plaster uh, dries up and, and, uh, and um, absorbs the pigment. The pigments remained pure and clear for the rest of the life of the plaster. And um, we have some examples from thousands of years and later Christian examples from 1,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, that are uh, the colors of vibrant to this day. Mosaic made from the assemblage of small pieces of colored glass or stone or other materials known as tesserae, which are put together in a very special way. Um, and all of these methods are still being done today. I would say that um, uh, encaustic and fresco is more difficult to make, so you don't you find them very often. But mosaic is frequently made even in our times. If, in fact, all you need to do is go to the cathedral uh, here, the Annunciation Cathedral. The entire cathedral is covered with mosaics. Portable icons on wood. This is the most common kind of icons that we have. And you will see them if you go next door afterwards. This is, the, this is just a, a, a piece of wood treated in a special way. And the icon is created on it. And, uh, and, the, and uh, these are easy to carry around. That's, that's why we call them portables. And we use them during the services, still in the Orthodox Church, um, depending on what the feast is and how we need to use it. And then we have plain wall paintings. In Greece, many times, because the churches are made out of uh, stone or made out of uh, plaster, they, the iconographer comes in and he paints straight on the wall. Here, because we're using um, these paper kind of walls, <laughs> what do you call them? Drywall. They are easy to, to be damaged, and you don't paint directly on them because they won't last very long. And of course, there is paper on top, and you're going to be painting on paper. So what they do, what iconographers do here in the United States, they do painting on canvas. And then they take the canvas, and they bring it, and they uh, stick it to the wall, and they put the pieces together as a puzzle and create an icon. If you go into an Orthodox church that has this, my church does in Marietta, um, you will see, and, and I watched the iconographer when he was doing it, um, he brought these pieces that you, I would not be able to put them together, he did, and especially the ones on the uh, dome of the church, which is a huge space, and he had to do it looking up most of the time. Uh, an amazing process, and you need a very smart guy to actually do things like that. There's a lot of mathematics there that even though you're not, uh, he's not a mathematician, he applies a lot of mathematics to put those things together. And so most commonly in the United States, we have this painting on canvas, which lasts for a long time. Even if there is water that seeps through the wall, um, the canvas is still safe. Okay, now that I said all that, let me show you an encaustic icon, uh, an icon 
done with the encapsulic method. Pigment, uh, pigments are mixed with wax and they're burnt into the wood. This icon is from the monastery of uh, uh, St. Catherine's on Sinai. I have actually seen it. It's not as big as that. It's about this big. Okay. And, um, and it's the er one of the earliest portable icons, probably the most, uh, the earliest po uh, portable icon of Christ that we have preserved to this day from the 6th century. I wanted to, sh to show you his face, close, close up of his face. What do you see here? There's a difference, yeah, between the one eye and the other. Hmm? The tear might be uh, an artifact uh, from the long time that this icon has been around. But it could be a tear of like he's actually crying because this shows a reaction to something. He's peaceful on this, time, on this side and there's a reaction here. He's upset. He is um, disturbed. Yes, can you see it? He is disturbed. Um, what would Christ be disturbed by? Our fallen nature, our, fallen nature, our sinfulness. He's crying for us. Okay. Many other things too, but let's let's stay with that. So the iconographer was conveying a specific point when he created that difference in the eye in the one side and in the other. Okay, this is a beautiful mosaic from the 11th century at the great church of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, um, which was uh, covered with plaster for uh, many centuries when the Muslims took over and uh, they turned that church into a mosque. Uh, and then uh, in 1931, the church, the, they turned Hagia Sophia into a museum. So they began to open up the iconography that was on the walls. And this is what they revealed here. It's actually the Theodogos on one side, the Virgin Mary, and, and St. John on the other. It's the, the icon of Thesis, the supplication. And Christ in the center, um, bearded with long hair. Um, he has this blue over him and this red underneath. We'll talk about that in a moment. He's holding the gospel and his blessing with his right hand. With a footstool, uh, with, uh, with a, um, a pillow behind him, and blessing with his right hand and holding a book, the book of the gospels. And this is from uh, the church of the Protadon in Caries, which is the the center of Mount Athos, if you, if you don't know what Mount Athos is, ask me later, I'll explain. Um, by one of the most famous iconographers uh, from the 13th century. So it's a proclamation of who this is. He is the savior of the world. He is Jesus Christ, the Christ, and he is the light of the world. And he's God and man. There is one more element. This thing, this thing, and this thing. What is that? That's actually two words. It's the article O in Greek, which would be translated the in English. Okay, like you say, the man, the person, right? In English, of course, when you use it for um, personal pronouns, you don't, uh, for personal, for names, you don't put a pronoun. In Greek, you always do. It's the way you distinguish masculine from feminine from neuter. Okay, in the English, you don't do it for names. But here, o on, om, omega, and ni, the n, right? This is a proclamation of who he is as he appeared in the Old Testament. So, in the early church, and subsequently, uh, at least in the Orthodox Church, I'm not sure what the other traditions might have. There is an understanding that God the Father never appeared. Only the Logos, the Word of God, appeared. Through the Word, this is from the Gospel of John. Through the Word, the world was created. All creation was created through, through the Word of God. The Word was with God from the beginning, and there was never a time when he was not with the Father. 
okay, and the Holy Spirit, the beholder. So when you put an icon in the space where you are, you're opening a window, you're opening a window into another realm, the realm of heaven, the realm of God. I'll talk about it in a little bit of how that works. But they're also pulling in, um, or rather, they're pulling you into that, into that realm, but they're also projecting into your realm um, what is happening in that icon. So, they project the saint or Christ or the event into the space and time of the beholder, thus sanctifying our space and time. But they open also a window into the time and space of the biblical event, which they depict, inviting the beholder to transcend time and space and enter and experience that event, enter and experience the Christ event. So holy icons open a window for the beholder into the heavenly dimension in which the saint currently exists as well. The Orthodox icon of the resurrection has um, Christ descending into Hades, breaking the doors of this place, whatever it is, where souls are asleep. The Jews called it uh, Sheol, the Greeks called it Hades. Um, and what does he do? What does he do? He descends into Hades to retrieve those who have died before he came. And the first ones is Adam and Eve. He pulls them by the hand. You see how he grabs them by the wrist from here. Not by the hands, but to make sure he's going to get them out. Okay? And then surrounded by Adam and Eve is on this side the just men and women of the, uh, of the Old Testament with first one, a young man who died early. The first one who died. What's his name? Abel. And, of course, Cain is the one who killed him, his brother. He's not here. On the other side, we see the prophets. Who was the last prophet? John the Baptist, right there. Then you have uh, Solomon and David behind him or whoever. So, this is the Orthodox understanding of the resurrection. That is a descending to Hades, is a salvation event that brings people back and opens up the kingdom of God where... The thief enters first, and others are resurrected uh, at the moment of the death of Christ when the, the earth is shaken and the tombs are open, and many of the old uh, people of the Old Testament are risen who enter heaven with their uh, bodies, resurrected bodies. So, you go to the Vatican Museum. So, you go to the Vatican Museum. remember what year this is but I took this picture myself so the heads of the people here are <laughs> I can't get them out I didn't want to go into too much trouble so I left them I took this with my iPhone I said this is a contrast to the other one so let me show it so here you see a triumphant Jesus coming out of a very realistic scene of coming out of the uh, the tomb and uh, the the guards are dispersing they're scared they're running and what does he hold in his right hand? In his left hand, actually. What is he holding? Hmm? The flag of the the Crusaders. The Crusaders. Okay, Crusader flag. Okay. Museum, museum in Florence, and here is a painting which is very similar, at least in um, in the understanding. Okay, where triumphant Jesus rising with a Crusader flag. Uh, the, the guards are sleeping and or they are scared and they're running away as he comes out of that triumphantly. Now this is Renaissance. Okay, before that the icon was similar to the East. What do I have here? Reintroduction of statutes. The first time, because statutes were forbidden uh, by the early church 
through the councils because they were, um, they were a danger for especially the illiterate people who came into the church who might think that, who were coming from paganism, they were worshiping statues of the gods, and they thought that the god dwelt in the statue, they didn't want them to do things like that, so they abolished the statue, they forbade them. Both east and west, um, statues disappear until this point. So, and some of these statues are amazing and beautiful, but I'm saying they were reintroduced by Michelangelo the first one to do statues for the three-dimensional things. And I was, I was moved by it when I saw it, but at the same time, I knew that this was the beginning of something different, okay? So the Pieta by Michelangelo, 1498 to 1499, and then this amazing thing here, David, completely naked, like what we see here, Jesus, not completely, this guy is completely naked. And his eyes, if you look at them closely, they're like hearts. Hearts. Michelangelo was in love with him. Beautiful statue, amazing statue, imitating the ancient Greek statues. Okay, very realistic. Of course, it's huge. Um, an amazing piece of art. But this was designed to be either outside the church or inside the church. I'm not quite sure. The beginning, I think, it was outside. Today is in a museum, of course. But statues were introduced into the churches. We went to the place where... Um, let, me, let me go back. We went to the place where the chains of St. Peter are, and there are two more statues, oh, several more statues, actually, made by Michelangelo of um, Prophet Moses, some of the women from the Old Testament, I have to say it's a new thing in Christianity. Okay? And then, let's go to the next one. Michelangelo again. He is the, one of the, the only painting from his hands that we have. He has, uh, again, realistic painting. Um, the colors are reversed, actually. The Virgin Mary. Okay? This is, of course, uh, Joseph. Baby Jesus completely naked with his genitals uh, showing. And this is John the Baptist, if you haven't seen this. And uh, what's going on behind them? All these naked people, where did they come from? Again, imitation of ancient Greek art introduced in religious art. Okay? Naked people. Now, this is something else is happening. He opens the door. Michel Michelangelo opens the door. So this is what happens right after. We have um, the Sistine Madonna of Raphael. It's, it's, a, it's a painting. It's a small painting. Not Jesus again. The Theodogos naked feet. Um, St. Barbara. Again, shoulders showing. Um, beautiful woman, right? Not, not like St. Catherine. Realistic. Um, and then the only one who's covered is St. Sixtus, who actually paid for this painting. And then the angels are naked. Not too naked, but starting to. And I'm putting this as a comparison with, again, the more traditional art, which is present in the West, of course, and museums are filled with this. Go to the next uh, one. Uh, this is a revolution. Revolution. This is the Madonna of the Long Neck by Parmigiano, 1530 to 33. We're in the depth of um, uh, the Renaissance, and we're at the beginning of what? What else has happened since 1517? The Reformation. Okay, the Reformation. Reformation until now. Now, this is the Madonna of the Long Neck by Parmigiano. This is the first painting where the Virgin Mary's breast is distinctly shown while well, baby Jesus is completely naked with his genitalia showing. After this, the Renaissance art becomes more and more humanistic, realistic, sensual, and loses completely the spiritual and mystical aspects of the original iconographic art of the previous centuries depicted on the right side. Um, you have uh, columns in the back. You have this. The Sistine Chapel. I think this is the ultimate of all things. You might have gone to the Sistine Chapel, but you didn't see things close up. I'm going to show you some things to give you a reality of what it's there. 
Let's see. The first thing is a uh, naked man and God who creates him. This is very classy. I mean, you, you have seen this everywhere. It's the creation of man by God. Um, I, I'm not here to interpret or to tell you exactly what happens. I'm just showing you. I'm moving to the next one. Now, this is the first time that Jesus is depicted naked like this. Uh, and he looks and the Virgin Mary next to him. And he looks, uh, he's beardless and compounded from antique conceptions of Hercules, Apollo, and Jupiter, Fulminator. Probably in particular, the Belvedere Apollo brought to the Vatican by Pope Julius II. So these artists are influenced by the Greek art that was done in the past, and they bring it into uh, what they consider now Christian art. <laughs> 